welcome to Free For All Friday. Everybody's welcome to celebrate growing and cultivate problem solving. This is our first Free For All Friday. We're coming to you from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen Nicola. And I'm Janet Makanovich. That's us sticking our nose in things and taking pictures of it and writing about it for you. Our daughter, Sonia Nicola, is here today. She's participating. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with our weekend walkabout webinars on, the, on Saturdays, Sonia has been for going on her fifth year now, our, our moderator, our technical support. Um, she's a wonderful gardener and an incredible professor of, uh, at, at a university. So she's used to doing these things. So, but she's here just to keep an eye on us because Steve and I are trying this in a different way. Uh, if you're looking at my name uh, on my uh, on the participants list, you'll see that I am just Janet, and Stephen is solo Steve, Stephen for uh, these meetings, and we will um, do the best that we can to keep up with whatever questions you have, and we're hoping that you have a lot of questions because that's what's what's driven the writing that we've been doing. It's why we put up our website is because we had so much good information that we wanted to be able to access quickly, not go through boxes and files. So we put what we've been writing onto our, our website. Um, and it started with the with my book, Designing Your Gardens and Landscapes, and then moved to Steve's in my book, Caring for Perennials. And then 13 years of writing in the newspaper and 10 years of writing in Michigan Gardener, various stints writing in Better Homes and Gardens and in uh, um, uh, for ortho, for uh, some of their books, perennial gardening, for instance, and and a lot of projects that involve friend gardeners, volunteer gardeners working together, like at the zoo, and all of that information we've been trying to put onto the website, and we'll show you how to find some of that stuff now. So we've added a page, changed things around where we used to have a forum, and we do still have a forum which you can read the questions, but we can't let anyone post questions on the forum. It became a place where we were constantly, constantly having to boot uh, fishers and, and hackers off of there. Um, and for security reasons, we closed down the posting, but there's there's hundreds and hundreds of questions there on the forum. So it's still there, but we made a, a, a menu item for Friday so that if you want to, you can learn about these things that we're gonna be doing from seven to 8 p.m. on Friday evenings each Friday, except the Friday right before a weekend walkabout. So you might want to go to the Friday page and you can, it'll take you over to the um, the link for that week's meeting and to a schedule that'll tell you when they are. When they are. So let's get into it here. Number one, free for all Friday is today. And we'll start with, anybody got any questions? Um, because we do want to, we do want to take your questions rather than what we think you might want to know. So yes. Stephen, you are you are on chat right now. So if you've seen anything, you can feed that over to me. Otherwise, we'll keep on going. What is this, Stephen? Is that crown fetch? Are we are you are we gonna be at any garden centers besides the nursery by Utica? Uh Wiggins? no, I don't I, I don't the English Gardens is put us putting us on their radio show this year. I don't they're not doing us on a garden day thing, not at least not that I've heard about yet. Um so no, I don't think any other garden centers. Uh, if so, if somebody knows someone who'd like us to be there, let us know because we we'd love to go. It's great to meet people and going to garden yep. centers. Ha, I can do that any danger. Will Robinson danger? <laughs> yeah, there's a whole center. whole list of plants that I'm looking for right now. Okay, and the list grew today because we were working at the library and we now have spaces for new things. Okay, Donna had a question. Are the deer particular about which hydrangeas they munch on? Similar to Hassas, there are varieties the deer will walk through to get to the varieties they prefer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I know that they like the Annabelles, and and I know that because I've told a number of people, well, go ahead and let them eat the Annabelles, the, the white snowball hydrangeas, because those bloom on new wood. But I certainly see them just um, decimate oak leaf hydrangea. Pam Palachuk was trying to keep them out and they would they would get there and you could tell that anything that stuck out just a little bit out of the wiring that she put out, they were munching down. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. There there might be some that there maybe some maybe somebody wants to plant all six kinds of hydrangeas and and leave them un unprotected and see which the deer go to first. Um it what was it? Was it at the Holden Arboretum that they told us that they think that the deer go mostly for the ones that have been heavily fertilized, so anything new they eat? So you'd have to get all your hydrangeas at the same time from the same grower to make sure that one of them wasn't um, more uh, nitrogen rich than another one does. 
Karen is wondering about uh, the soil being 60 degrees before you transplant in the spring. Is this true? Uh, she saw some some people dividing in northern Michigan today. Um, well, we were just doing that today at the zoo. We, we tell people to wait until the soil, you can put a handful of soil in your hand, squeeze it, and then open your hand and it should just crumble out, not stay squeezed. Um, and if it's if it still stays in a heavy clump, then you want to wear snowshoes. Sonia in this picture is wearing snowshoes in the garden. But we were out today, and this is uh, <laughs> this is Paul and Carol digging out a Baptisia. They are not easy to get out of the ground. It must have taken the two of them maybe forty five minutes to lever this thing out, cut and lever this thing out of the ground. And we moved that peonies, daisies, coreopsis, um, butterfly bush, beautyberry daffodils, um, several kinds of bulbs, camacia, not tulips, what we just didn't have any tulips to move, thyme. We moved everything because we were taking uh, beds that had had new edges put around them at the Waterford Library. The new edges were supposed to be the same profile as the old edges, but they're higher. So we had to lift everything on the beds, put soil in and put everything back in, which is a pain including raising irrigation lines, but it was also great because it meant that we get to take apart every bed and say, let's move this over there and move that over there and move the goro over here. Um, and everyone was having a great time. We've been, Stephen and I, for our whole time gardening together, and that goes back more than 40 years. When we have time, we go and do it. And we've moved things in every month of the year. Why they would have to, why the soil would have to be 60 degrees, I don't know, because roots are growing great guns right now. Uh, we took out a butterfly. I took out a butterfly bush and gave it to um, poor, was it Donna? Yeah, Donna had to sort it out. Um, because if you look at the, this is looking at the bottom of the butterfly bush. There's the pot that it was in. And I took it out of where it was because it was rather underwhelming. It's one of the many, many butterfly bushes. And we wanted it to be the, sh the centerpiece in the annual bed. And it just wasn't enough. Well, I can see why it wasn't enough. The roots never had a chance to really get out. There were like two roots that were able to get out and spread out the way they should. Because the butterfly bush wants to have roots five feet out in all directions. So she clipped off. She just clipped them so that they weren't in a square anymore. And we put that back in in a new place. And it was already growing new white roots. Um, so I, I don't think that there's really a, a neat re reason for it to be 60 degrees. If you're transplanting things from inside a greenhouse to out, then yeah, you would definitely wait because those plants have had warm soil. But when you're doing field stuff like this, you're just moving it from the place that it was and was fine to another place where it's going to be fine. Sorry, Stephen. When is the best time to divide daffodils and tulips? Did you answer that? I don't know. Oh, whenever you can get to them. We, we didn't divide, um, we didn't lift all the daffodils and tulips. There's daffodils and camacia in this bed here. Camacia is Indian pomash. No reason to lift them. And they're they're only planted at about six or seven inches deep. I, I tell the people that work with us, I say, okay, plant those deep, plant them 10 and 11 inches deep. And they never do. They, they plant them deep, but they're not deep enough. So um, some of them, this, you might be able to tell that there's a mound around this daffodil. We mounded soil around the daffodil in order to hold it upright while we added soil all around it. But the camacia, we just covered them right up because their flowering stalks aren't coming up yet. But we could just dig them up. And we did dig some of them up that were in the middle of the butterfly bush and some other things and, and divided them and put them back in. We've divided daffodils when they're just opening blooms and set them into the ground deeper so that there's ground level and there's this little daffodil head looking out at you from ground level. So go ahead and do them when you can. Uh, maybe the answer to when you move bulbs is when you can get into the bed and they're not disturbing, you're not disturbing too many things to dig them up because they're always in the middle of something else. Okay. Uh, any more gardening with Janet and Stephen's sessions? And what is the next date for the Waterford Library Gardeners meeting? The next date for Waterford Library is the second Wednesday in April. And there may be before then, there may be a uh, calendar. Where are you calendar? There we are. So that would be April 10th. April 10th at the Waterford Library is our next date. We are putting our Garden by Janet and Steve's on our calendar. So if you go to Garden A to Z homepage and the About Us section has a calendar in it, plus there's a link right on the, on the front page that says where you can find us. We didn't put this one today because it was supposed to be last time at the library, but it was, there was snow on the ground. 
So we moved it. And because it was Good Friday, some people were sure that nobody would come. Well, we had a whole big group there. So we tried to put them on there. People thought the library was open because of all the cars in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had quite quite a convention there. It was great. We had a good time. See the ramp that's behind me. I'm standing there right here. We had a, a car ramp. So we were able to ramp up the wheelbarrow um, in, into the beds. And it was great. People were empowered by that. I mean, everybody was coming in with a wheelbarrow and, and emptying it. What else have we got? Okay, Judith from Eastern Massachusetts, Zone 6A. What are you direct planting or starting this week? Direct, where, what are we doing this week? Direct planting or starting this week? We're direct planting lupin seeds and alyssum seeds and um, golden rain, since the rabbit's got our golden rain tree. Priscilla and Paul, if you're here, I am so sorry. The golden rain tree seedling that you gave me from the one that I gave you had got to five feet tall and was doing so well that we took down the spruce that was near it because it's the replacement for the spruce. And we took down the spruce and the rabbit got the golden rain tree. I'm hoping that it's going to sucker back up from the roots, but meanwhile, we'll start some more. Um, uh, what and we're not we're not putting anything in the ground new uh, other than seed this year this week we'll mostly be moving things around so i'm moving some things that were excess at the library over to tracy's garden next door and i'll be moving some things at a at our neighbor tina's garden this week but i'm i'm transplanting plants and i'm only direct planting seeds because the ground is cool and any place i would get plants from those plants would have to be hardened off and it'll take me maybe a week to harden them off Nice to talk mm -hmm. to you, Judith. Judith went there around the uh, Native Plant Trust with us, Steve. A couple people uh, mentioned that they seem to lean line light, Annabelle's, or uh, they don't eat somebody's oak leaf or Annabelle's for Nancy. I, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that the deer don't eat things in one place or another. Um, our friend, Burdette, raised sheep. And she believed in leaving the lambs with their mothers out in the field because she found that if she let the lambs out by themselves, they ate things that they shouldn't eat. But if they went out with their mothers, they ate what their mothers ate. And if you look at deer and say that in this neighborhood, they say, they've never touched my tulips. Yet I think of tulips as being deer candy. So this some population of deer have not learned to eat the tulips. Don't let them learn. <laughs> um, but I, I've definitely seen them eat oak leaf hydrangea down to nothing. And uh, I, I don't see them eat the uh, panicle hydrangeas like limelight, the conical clustered ones, so much. But that's mostly because by the time I'm done with those, there's not much left for them to eat. And they like to eat the buds. Um, Fran is asking, uh, uh, new, a friend has a new house. He hasn't seen the hydrangeas bloom. How would she know what she's going to help him prune? How would she know what? type of hydrangea it is, whether she should prune it or not. Okay, we do have an article on hydrangeas. Um, I could I could look that up when we switch over to, 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 to my turn to look at the chat. Um, but there are pictures in an article about pruning hydrangeas that show you the stem of, uh, of the big leaf hydrangea. And it does have a different shape bud and a bigger bud at the tip than the uh, snowball hydrangea. And those are the two that are most confused confused in people's minds. The, oh, the um, mop head blues and pinks with the big bud, um, the big leaf hydrangeas, those are the ones that you have to leave some of those big buds at the tip or you're not going to bloom that year or you're, any bloom you get would be late and low on the plant. Uh, but you, uh, I'll, I'll look that up and see if I can find it for you. This is a good time to say that if you're, if you're um, asking questions and want to ask something more about them, or you're asking a question and we don't get to it or don't get to it sufficiently for you, make sure you send us an email because we we um, we sometimes see questions that we missed or we want to say something more about it. And we realize that the, the screen name that you have on these meetings doesn't link us to your email. So uh, you could email us at any time and say, I asked a question if you've got any more or I asked a question, can you tell me more? Send us an email so that we, we know who it is that we're trying to trying to get back in touch with. Oh, rabbits eat the tulips, says Karen. Yeah, the rabbits are. Uh, yeah, there's a hand up from Nancy. Nancy, you know how to Nancy's do this. Nancy's iPad. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. We, You know how to do this. Hi, Janet. 
Hello. Um, we are in the situation where we need to make some changes and additions to the landscape in front of our house. Um, I wonder, now we're not, we're not computer savvy as you and Steven are, um, but I wonder if there's a program where I can take a photo of the front of the house, find the shrubs I'm interested in or the plants I'm interested in, somehow get them to be the appropriate size and just plop them in there and move them around. I, I think that 3D Landscape Planner is still out there. It was the program that I played around with when we were looking at, at doing things like that. Um, so there, there was one and it came with a little library of plants, um, maybe the plants that you'd be looking for. You might, you might have to find a way to import some pictures into it because it's made for the whole country. So of course there's um, crepe myrtles and, and uh, gardenias and things in there that you wouldn't, wouldn't pick and maybe the thing that you wanted to put in and take a look at wasn't there. Um, and 3D Landscape Planner lets you scan in a picture of your house what was the other one? There is another one. It, yeah. I don't know of any because I didn't pay attention. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one that was, that was uh, um, surfing around looking for those. And I think I, I just put in a landscape planning program, um, landscape visualization program, and a, a number of things came up. But if you see 3D Landscape Planner, I, was, I, I thought that was a pretty good one. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm also interested in the... Uh um webinar tomorrow uh narrow and shallow spaces yeah you do have yes. some. in fact i was mm -hmm. looking for a picture of your side walkway i said here's a narrow space that somebody did cool yeah. things with okay thank you to comacia grow well mm -hmm. in a in a, a container is there anything lined up before that Stephen, or should we talk no about not that i saw yeah comacia other uh, than comments about eating what eats about eating <laughs> yeah not us, the animals. <laughs> Camacia will grow in a container. The Camacia is is uh, also called quamash or Indian quamash. So a lovely blue or um, white. Let's see. I think we got a picture of it someplace. Where is it in the lawn one? That's Camacia. It blooms after the daffodils and tulips. This is a pale blue one. We we grow the one called Blue Danube, which is a darker blue. And then there's a taller one that's all white. Um, they bloom after the tulips and daffodils, which is nice. They are um, wonderful in boggy areas where it gets wet occasionally, so rain gardens and, and whatever. And uh, I know that they will grow in a pot, but it, I suspect that you're going to have to water them pretty heavily to get them to color up well, because they're not going to be as healthy as they should be if, if they're just standard water. So you may want to do the thing where you have them with a uh, your basin underneath your pot has pebbles in it and you just keep filling the basin and keep that the bottom uh, level full of water um, so that it's it's constantly got water available to it. They're lovely bulbs. They're, they get a little carried away with themselves in terms of lots and lots of foliage laying on tops of things. We grow them in among our milk, our swamp milkweed in the rain garden. And sometimes I worry that the swamp milkweed is not going to come through, which is a dumb thing to worry about because swamp milkweed always makes its way through. But I'm, you'll see me out there after the camacia bloom kind of pushing the leaves out of the way to, to let light get down to the uh, swamp milkweed. So back to topics here. And I think we want to talk to people. Uh, Pam came to the Garden by Janet and Stephen today and said her, her cannas didn't bloom. And I went, I said, I know we've talked about cannas not blooming before and what it takes to grow them well. Um, something that we could start right now. The, the can, when, we, when I talked to Pam about her cannas not blooming last year and what could she do this year? Did they need extra fertilizer? Cannas do like a really rich soil. Um, they grow well in a bog where it's, you've got lots of organic matter in there, but that's not gonna stop them from blooming the fact that they're not getting or as rich as they could have. But we'll, what will stop them from blooming is being too cold early in the year because they like a warmer soil to really get get um, a running start at the beginning of the year. And last year it was it was cold and it was rainy all through April, not great can of weather. So you can start them indoors like you do dahlias. Um, put just a, an inch or two of soilless potting mix in the bottom of a good sized pot. Put your can of tuber on top of it and cover just the tuber. So now you've got a pot that's maybe, maybe you've got a quarter of the pot got some soil in it. 
let the canna sprout. And as it sprouts, keep adding soil on top of it because you won't have to take it out into the sun until you get soil filled all the way to the top. And that gives you time to start it in a warm place and then move it out to keep it warm. And once you get it started early, it, it, they should bloom this year. Um, so that you can find if you just, I searched canna and what, and the search sent me, for instance, this is our, our earlier writings before we got into writing, growing, um, what's coming up were growing concerns. And so it came, it led me to this one. It's very, it's actually pretty simple to find things on the website once you understand that we've got things organized by season. Let's see, where do we have one that's, there we go. Um, in our what's up section, so on the home page, on any page, the, the main menu, what's up is our what's coming up uh, section. And when you open it up, if you've got a desk computer like I took this picture from, there will be a whole list of our departments, tip cuttings and 45 mile per hour garden and the big mistake, big lesson section. There's also one called ensemble editions. And if you open that, there is early winter, late winter, uh, winter, late winter, early spring. And if it's early spring, which if you clicked on early spring, it would tell you that that's from mid-March to mid-April. Um, yeah, mid-March to mid-April. Then you could see all of the issues that we've issued at that time, and you could click through those just for the season. They're kind of a, um, a browsing way to find things. Otherwise, put in a search term and find things that way. Oh, definitely, you can put Linaria and Columbine seeds outside, Nancy. Um, I've always wanted to grow Linaria purpurea. I had such a bad, um, what do you call it? A bad uh, experience with Linaria, the yellow one. Uh, I just ran around like crazy. Uh, so I was a little gun shy of trying Linaria purpurea, but I think I saw it in your garden or someone else's garden and it reminded me that I always wanted to grow that. But it's definitely a cool season plant that'll germinate well. And so will the columbine, the seedlings are popping up all over. Another thing that's popping up this week are the maple seeds. They're, they're coming to maple seeds. So if you use weed uh, leaves in your in your garden, you're, uh, you're probably gonna wanna go and pluck out some of the maples that are coming up. Barb is asking, what is a soilless mix? Oh, the soilless mixes are those that you, most mostly it's what you buy in the nurseries, pro mix, sunshine mix, um, miracle Girl potting mix. It's a, it's a mixture of bark and usually bark and peat. And we had this whole discussion about um, using other types of things like uh, shredded newspaper. I can't remember what the newspaper was called. It came out of Pittsburgh and so they called it pit moss. Yes. So we bought pit moss and used it in some of the containers at the, at the uh, uh, library and found that a review that we read was accurate. You really needed to mix it with some of the bark peat mix in order to keep it from clumping up. So it's it's a mix that is not based on soil. It's based on bark and peat. Um, and it might have some fertilizer mixed in with it. It's a lighter weight. It drains really well. Um, it's sterile. Uh, it doesn't have seeds in it, so you don't have stuff coming up. Um, and it is uniform. So it's used a lot in the nursery industry in order to start the plants in the pots and, and we can buy it too. And they call it soilless mix or potting mix. And Therese has a hand up. Go ahead, Therese. Hey, Therese. Hi, guys. Um, hey, just real quickly, I wanted to uh, just get a clarification. Um, when we were talking about butterflies, you mentioned that when you cut a stem of a milkweed, if you burn the end, um, it kind of pulls that milk out a little bit so the water can go up the stem. But could you um, just clarify that a little bit? And I mean, are we talking like five, six seconds of heat on the end of that or what? What? Tell me. I I, um, I was told to burn the, the milky sap on milkweed and balloon flower and dandelions. It really worked on the dandelions just long enough to to see that the um, sap changes color. It changes to kind of a brown or it might change to a black. And what it does is it solidifies it so that it keeps an opening but that water can make its way through. Otherwise it's like water and oil. They don't they don't mix very well. Uh, it, it, but but you I was but, just gonna say I, I have noticed oh, go ahead. But I, I've been watching what Sonia's doing and Sonia just pulls the stem out rather than cuts it. She um, well she does cut them too. But she puts them directly into water and they work just fine. So I don't know that you really need to do that. 
Well, for uh, the ones down here in the Keys, it's uh, Gigantia, uh -huh. and you cut a stem off, and of course, it you know it milks. Yeah. So yeah. I have noticed that um, heating it does make a difference, and um, you know I just want to make sure I was doing it right. You know, like just until like you say, it kind of changes color or bubbles. Yeah, yeah, but it bubbles, a, it bubbles okay. a little too. Yeah, it definitely made a difference okay. with the dandelions because you know how the kids will bring in dandelions and then they're so disappointed when the dandelions yeah. are all floppy in a little while. It, definitely with dandelions, if you burn that uh, the base, they keep they they keep nicely. <laughs> like we need. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Sure. Judith is asking if we have a favorite DIY potting mix recipe. How much of any fertilizer do you put in? Does that recipe include what we get from our local nursery that big bag you had me go get <laughs> yeah um we we almost always use the mix that we can get at the nursery and we particularly like our local bordines um they make their own mix we like that and it does not have any fertilizer in it i would prefer to fertilize things um individually sometimes what did we just pot up oh uh the cabbage plant for my granddaughters at the uh, in the grade where they give each kid a cabbage plant at the beginning of the year and the biggest cabbage at the end of the year gets a gets a, a prize of some kind. So when we potted up her little cabbage seedling, we mixed some slow release organic um, spoma holitone in with it just so that there would be something there and not have to worry about it. But for the most part, I would much rather watch a container plant and use some uh, water soluble stuff on them when they need it when I when they the color indicates that they're getting a little chlorotic or weak, um, and and we don't mix our own. We do we do change it. So for the aloe plants that we were potting up a few weeks ago, we used half and half sharp sand, just the builder sand that you mix in with concrete or you put underneath bricks, and a potting mix. So we mix them together. Um, and there are people that will use a really heavy bark mix for some of the epiphytes, like the orchids and staghorn, elkhorn well, ferns, staghorn ferns, yeah. What we have found, generally speaking, is that the nurseries that do a lot of their own potting up, use their own and make their own mix, if they sell it, it usually is a pretty, really a good lightweight mix because they don't want it's got a whole, it's, it, there's a lot of things that a nursery wants that container to do. And yeah. So. Yeah. And they're, they're not about to be mixing up something different. It's the same stuff that they're mixing up for themselves in bulk to use for all those pots yeah. in their nursery. So it's not. And, and if you wanted to, you could ask them where they got theirs from. If you particularly buy a plant from the nursery and like that ask them where they got that mix if they don't mix it themselves. That's right. And uh, and I, I have actually a bee in my bonnet about fertilizer already mixed into some of these ready-made mixes. Because if you look at the weight of the bag and the amount of fertilizer there probably is in there, you're probably paying about 10 times as much for the fertilizer in that bag as if you bought fertilizer and mixed it in yourself or used it when you need it. And I think this is just another way to get more money to the, the big companies. It could also depend on what you're putting in that pot. If it's some plants have already been fertilized, some get slow release fertilizer in the nursery that's up potting them. Some get fertilizer every time they get watered from water soluble, they combine it in the way they water the plants. Um, I think more often, even when we plant outside, it, it's rare that we add fertilizer Till we notice maybe something might be wrong, I think. Right, yeah. Our soil test still says that our potassium is low, but everything else is fine. So I still continue to chop up every banana peel I can get a hold of and put it out there. And uh, if I see a plant in trouble, I'm, I might I might spend some of our money to buy some uh, green sand, which is a potassium source. But the only green sand that's being mined in the world appears to be coming out of Russia right now. And I'm not keen on supporting that particular industry. Look at all of the seedling um, winter aconites coming up in this picture, Stephen. I am so jealous. I've yeah, always right. wanted to have a big oh, I, I, I'm, I'm using my pointer. Janet's wondering what's that a picture of, and I'm not sure if it was for this image or the previous one. This one. This one, Janet says. This, the, yeah, this one is winter is a winter aconite, and um, 
which winter aconite is it? And it's going to it's going to uh, it ends in C I C A. It it's ends the scientific C. name. Oh, let me see. Winter oh, oh, I see. Um <laughs> so let me see. It's Aranthus. Well, what is it? Aranthus? I thought it was Aranthus hyamelis. It must be Aranthus it, persica. Uh, this uh, one might be persica because it's a little bit quite a bit higher than the hamamelis. They, that's a little bit lower one, isn't it? Uh, um, well, it's going to seed, and they're, they're Himalayans, talking. but yeah, it's it's uh, um, but th that's a seed pod. You can see that. Oh, okay. Open. It's not the flower anymore on these. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Can you put preen down now? Um, if you're it depends with preen on what weeds you're trying to keep out. If they've already germinated, the preen's not going to do much to them. But if um, you you know that you've got a big crop of lamb's quarters that's gonna and crabgrass that's gonna come up as soon as the, the ground gets warm, then preen can help you out. But so can mulch. Um, Cornell found that preen uh, that the the most effective and least the most effective, efficient, and least costly weed control was mulch. Um, so if if any of that matters to you, then don't use the preen. And um, and do remember that preen is a herbicide. It does work on all plants but the way that it works in a layer when you put it on the soil it when it gets wet a little bit of it melts out and there's a film of water with the herbicide in it that is imbibed by the seedlings near the surface and generally it doesn't get mixed down deep into the soil but if you use it repeatedly then the um the perennials the, the longer lasting and deeper rooted wider rooted plants start responding to it starting with things in the lily family and the impatience um, at the botanical gardens where we went, there was one great, great example of this. I don't know if we got a picture of it, Steve, when Larry was walking us through. I was just going to say, we had that, they showed us at a botanic garden that that specifically, they know that's why that happened. Yep, that was. Uh, and, we, and I we think we have, I can't remember if it was St. If it was Missouri. No, it was the Royal Botanical Gardens. We'd heard Royal, oh, Missouri. yes. We yes. heard about it in Missouri and heard about it at the Holden. And then we saw it at and, and asked at the Royal Botanical Garden. They had um, they had had a big bed, uh, a long re re rectangular strip with um, calorie pears and pachysandra in it. And they decided we're getting rid of these calorie pears. So they took out the calorie pears and now the pachysandra was all in the sun. So they took out the pachysandra too. Then they looked at it and said, we really don't want it to be a rectangular garden anymore. So they changed the shape of it and then planted it all with annuals. And in the annuals, there was a rectangular strip of chlorotic plants all through for, and this was the second year already, um, because they'd been using preen repeatedly and it had built up in the soil. But the whole bed was shaped differently, but there was this rectangular strip going right through it where the pachysandra bed used to be. Um, so just be careful, don't, don't be using, don't overuse it. And if you've got the weeds under control, then, uh, and you're only worrying about seedlings, mulch is gonna be better for you than anything else. What do we do with the soilless media that we used last year? Do we revitalize it and reuse? And Judith has quite a collection from over the years, she says. In Tom's garden, 22 stories up in New York City, we reused everything we could reuse and just refreshed it. Um, so he would bring up bags of uh, dried cow manure and some new uh, perlite, the, the little white pieces in there that help keep it from clumping because the peat begins to break down and the bark breaks down and it starts getting a little, little, um, dense and the water doesn't flow through as well but there was no way with how many pots would you say he had up there steve 80 100 oh uh, big pots of, they was, were big to little i mean he had some that were massive. and some that were little yeah yeah um, a lot so in where when i have my way at my son's house i have him dump all of the potting mix out at the end of each year and start new again um but in a bigger pot where you've got a lot more volume, I might add some every year and just change some of it. Or like at, at uh, Tom's house where he had permanent plants like trees and shrubs in these pots, we would just uh, wet, take a wedge out of the side with a trowel or a shovel and add some fresh stuff in between. Um, yeah. Everybody does it differently, but you don't want it to, you don't want it to get tired and exhausted because then it doesn't drain really well. And we uh, we spread out the the old soil around in the gardens. Yes, it's great. yeah, it's it's yeah. good mulch. Um, it's all over in the gardens at the library yeah. because we take out those big planters that we put in there. 
And Priscilla asks, Arantis C. Priscilla Sica. I, I think that would that would fit. That would fit. Nice job. Gotta have. This is what's great about having gardeners together. Somebody is going to know someplace that they can look something up. Um, and where do we dump the potting mix out? I'll, I'll dump where I need mulch. I'll, I'll, I'll dump it out. So I'll take it out into a bed somewhere and use it as mulch because it's still clean for the most part at the end of the year. It might have roots in it and I can just break it up into, into pieces. Chunk it. A, lot of, a lot of what we moved around today at the library was um, we were moving potting mix too because we've been dumping our, our containers out when we dump them out uh, into the beds. There's no questions? That was all I've noticed. People it's like that Neil Young concert we listened to where he says, now we need to get into a very serious discussion. I can't think of what to play, he says. You know, yeah. we yeah. It, it's like that. You kind of get caught up where you want to talk about something, but you're not sure. You're hoping somebody brings up something. Please. I was hoping that somebody would bring up something about lawn because I when I went looking for lawn, because the lawns are in terrible shape. It has been some bad, bad growing years for lawn. Um, there, uh, it was nice last year that it was that it rained so much and and the lawns looked better. But before that, for five or six years, the lawns were drought stricken. They were dying back. The green that was in them had more to do with the weeds that were growing between the lawn blades than anything else. Um, and now is a really good time to fix your lawn. And when I went looking for our our best information on lawn, I found that issue thirty seven of what's coming up hasn't been posted yet. Um, I, it was still waiting for a sponsor. And I said, well, if we talk about it today, then I'll I'll post it and, and get it back up there. But um, definitely a, a problem with grub. People are blaming grubs. I got two questions this week already. There, there's grubs in my lawn. Um, what do I use on them? And they're assuming that grubs are why they've got bear patches in their lawn and not assuming that it's just weak lawn that's been mowed too short, not watered enough, not aerated enough. Um, uh, grubs are, are something that if you go out and dig up a square of lawn, dig up five squares of lawn uh, in different places, just take your spade and cut so that you've got a square foot and flip the sod over and count how many grubs you see. If you're not seeing on average now of these five that you pick, if you're not seeing nine, more than nine grubs per foot, then you don't have a grub problem. As long as the lawn is watered, the grubs are not going to eat faster than the, the grass can grow. Much more often, it's other problems. And uh, I just hate to see people spending the money on uh, insecticide to kill grubs, especially in the spring when the grubs are so big and, and ready to pupate that the insecticide has very little effect on them. Um, if we have a grub problem, then they do what greenskeepers do, and you put your grub control down in August and September more than any other time of year. Ah, that's a good one, Priscilla, that um, that the soilless potting mix changes its pH after a couple of years, which makes sense. The peat's breaking mm -hmm. down, and the peat is what's keeping it slightly acid. So, yeah, um, it's a good idea. It, it is expensive stuff. I know when we fill our containers at the library, and there are, how many did we load up today to repaint, Steve? Six, maybe? No, there's about seven. Uh, there's about nine, because yeah. there's three big ones, three little ones, and three medium. Yeah, these are some of the PVC pipes that I don't think I have a picture of them anywhere here um, today. The, um, PVC pipes that we um, cut off at the at the height that we want them to be and uh, fill them with potting mix. And there's a couple of them are two feet tall, one of them's three feet tall, but they probably cost us about 80 bucks in potting mix to fill completely. And we have to fill them completely this year because we had to empty them in order to bring them home, clean them up, and paint them the new color that they should be. They're slight. They're, they're We painted them the color of the um the cut. What do they call that? A steel, a tin roof. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. metal metal uh, roof steel roof. roofs, metal roof. And they uh, they re-roofed and they changed the color slightly, so our our color doesn't match anymore. So they got a little scratched up anyway, and we'll have to change the color. Our potted Easter plants out. Um, it, there are definitely um, there's definitely another life for those Easter plants. I usually enjoy them inside. We used to give them to Steve's mom, and then I would I would take them back after the flowers were were beginning to fade, and I would stick the the pots greens and all. I just stick them outside the door and let them sit for a week or so. As long as it didn't go below um, freezing during the night, I just leave them out. 
for a week and then sink them into the ground and sink them in deeper, um, almost bury the pots, uh, bury the tips of the leaves because the, for forcing in, in pots, even the lilies that they force in pots, they plant quite shallow because otherwise they have to use a really big pot to get them deep enough in the pot. And if you plant them that shallow, things are going to dig them up and eat them and they're going to come mm. up too soon in the spring. Um, just not really any good. Does anybody have experience with Let's Dance Hydrangea changing color? Question mark. And then uh, second sentence, to the blue that we are all after. Nancy was wondering. I, I wish I could confidently tell somebody how to get those things blue other than going out to Cape Cod and planting them out there. Um, yep. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Boy, the blue out there sure is sweet. <laughs> yeah. I and I don't know Let's Dance specifically, but I know a number of the uh, of the blue hydrangeas that planted in Michigan, where in the gardens that we've worked in, they will have washed out kind of blue, gray, pink, and white flowers all on the same plant because the different uh, sections of root are picking up different kinds of a. Uh, uh, minerals from the soil. If you can keep the soil acid, it, um, maybe you're using an acid-loving plant fertilizer and also mulching with something like coffee uh, coffee grounds or cocoa hulls or both, um, you can probably get a, a better blue, but I don't know about having that really good blue. And I'm sorry, I wish I could help you with that. Um, Ruth was asking where she can get a lawnmower that can cut up to five, four inches high. I would suggest going to a dealer like Weingarts that sells a lot of different types of mowers because uh, there are walk behinds, there's uh, ride them, you know, and uh, up to four inches that that would be something a salesman could really point you to. And, and you could talk to him about what other types of things you want with that. That's what I would you do. You cut ours four inches high, don't you, Steve? I mean, it's easily four inches it's high. Pretty Pretty close to four, and it's a it's a a, a Honda. The yeah. Toro didn't quite go as high. Yeah, that we had. Can Lily's wondering if can she use melorganite on her lawn? Yes, yeah, you can definitely use melor. It's a good use for melorganite. If we're gonna, eat. Uh, I had a big argument with my brother about um, melorganite and other sewage sludge project products. He said that stuff is. You know, it's it's human waste and stuff that came through the water treatment, the sewer system. I said, what are we going to do? Put it all on a landfill? It should be spread out and used. And, and they do test it for heavy metals. So I put it on lawns um, and, and yeah. this is a good time to do it. Not the stuff they're putting on. We've got people in the neighborhood already. The, the trucks are sitting in front of their lawn and spraying water-soluble fertilizer on the lawn on the the cool, cold, cool and cold soil and grass is not growing yet. But the and, and even a, with glove control there too, and and crabgrass control when it's not the soil's not warm enough yet for crabgrass to anyway. Um Janet Shank was asking about landscape supply companies. Um no, no, no. That was an answer to the question about mowers. Oh. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Ask them which mower that they're 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 using. Good. Thank you. Um, um, I see Barb's got a question about putting empty plastic water bottles at the bottom of a large pot so that you don't use so much potting soil. Um, if you're using a large pot because you're planting a plant that's a big plant or a lot of plants stuffed into it, I don't believe in putting things in the bottom of the pot because the, the potting mix drains well enough. It doesn't need to have crock, piece of crockery or whatever. And you're just denying space to the roots of the plant by putting styrofoam peanuts or whatever that there's a thing that lifts up the bottom of the pot higher. Um, I fill pots all the way. And at the end of the year, and in the fall, when I empty the pot, there's roots clear down to the bottom and I want them to have all the space. So go ahead and use them if, if you need to use them. But um, I, I don't. Every once in a while, and when I was, when we were gardening with crews, I'd be emptying a pot at the end of the year. And inside there would be upside down empty pots that one of the people that worked for us had put in the bottom and I, <laughs> I keep them and show them to people and say, you stop doing that. This was your, um, so I, I don't do that, but you can do it. Um, put me back to the reuse medium. Uh, could you mitigate the pH change with the uh, amendments? Sure you could. Um, I mean, that's how it got to be a certain pH in the first place, but 
Um, but you need to have a good pH meter to tell you what you, what's actually going on um, as you do that. Yeah. R Ruth has a comment about most grub chemicals are neonic neonicotinoids. Yeah. That are dangerous to bees and last in the ground for a long time. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, oh, I'm yep. glad that you're, I'm glad you're still on top of this stuff. Yeah. We, we just, there's just so little need really for insecticides. I'm sure in a lot of neighborhoods that the mobs of starlings are out at work. They were even on, Priscilla and I were talking about it today. They were out on the road eating the worms that came up after the rain that we had a little while ago. But the, the starlings will land on, the, on a lawn. And if one starling sticks his beak in and finds a grub, they say something and 99 other starlings show up and they work th through your lawn. And in our neighborhood, we also have sandhill cranes working through. They're taking those, those insects. And I'd like to know that they're taking those insects that are not loaded with, with uh, pesticides. Um, and they're doing a really good job of it. And, and what they don't get, the skunks get at night. So yeah. Well, Fran was asking about which brand of grass seed do we like for sun, sunshade? We I go to Scott, a. Uh, we, were using, we were using Scott's last year, Steve. Yeah, uh, you also read the ingredients, the one with the least weed seeds. Yeah, but it tells you on the label the percentage of weed seeds in there, and you want and, so and germination have, rate. The higher the germination rate, and the less less weed seeds. Yeah, and so for the most part, we end up buying a premium seed mix. There are um, at some of the. Um, grain elevators, co-ops, there's one in Dexter and Chelsea and Euros, and there's one in Livingston, they will have their own mix that they made for the area. For instance, there's real sandy soils out in the Milford, Livingston, Highland area. And so the seed mix, the grass seed mix that you buy there tends to have a lot of the tall fescues and the grasses that are going to do better in sandy soils. So you might want to ask it at a place like that. Let's see, where are you? What are you near? Fran, where are you near? Are you out in Whitmore Lake? I forgot. I'm, in, I'm in Southfield. Okay. Yeah. So you've got and Uncle Luke's. Okay. Um, oh yeah. 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 Give it. Give it a Uncle shot. Uncle Luke has mixes. Okay. Good. Thanks. Sure. Ruth also commented, "Milogonite not recommended for food growing areas." Yeah, yeah, that goes back to that argument, the or that suspicion that people have that there's heavy metals in it, or uh, something that can be absorbed in some of the plants. Um, what was his name? The guy, the professor at Ohio State that we used to listen to, and he was he was kind of like a preacher. Um, he he claimed that they were doing a lot of studies on which vegetable plants. And I think last time I talked to Ruth, we were working on this because her own property had um, did it have mercury in it, Ruth? What was it that um, there was some heavy metal, and some plant families will absorb that. Others will not absorb it or will put mm. it in the parts of the plant that we don't eat. And, and that was a very interesting thing to even think about using, to use the plants to mitigate the heavy metals in the soil or in the milorganite. <laughs> the, little, the little lawn crew that are out there. Steve's got a, a bug up his butt about the uh, starlings though this year because he put out mealworms for the uh, the wrens that we've got um, hanging and, around. And hopeful bluebird that I saw earlier. Yep. Yeah. And... Uh, and one of one starling found his feeder with mealworms in it, and, and within an hour, ten minutes. <laughs> no, it was ten fifteen minutes gone. Every starling in the area had, had taken their turn at that place. Um, so yeah, I'd rather that they ate the stuff in the lawn. I think they purposely were running into the feeder to make the mealworms fly out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably were shaking them out. Yeah. Stephen, this is garlic mustard. I mean, that's very pretty, but this is garlic mustard you've got a picture of. It's called weeds. Yeah, okay. Pretty weeds, I guess. The mealworms were dried. Yeah, they're freeze-dried, which may, means that the adults are going to eat them and they'll go get a drink, but it's not going to do for the seat, for the nestlings. The, those no. those uh, birds in the nest have got to have insects. They cannot survive and grow without a, the protein that you get from insects, and they need to have moist insects because they're not drinking any other way. There was sure a lot of little teeny tiny um, flies flying low to the ground th this week at various times. Yeah, they were hatching, hatching out of the uh, debris on the ground. We have seen the wrens. Our Carolina wrens are year-round here now. Um, I don't think our, our regular house wren 
I, I haven't. I haven't seen the house run yet. Yeah, but the Carolina runs are here all year, all year. They have been this year. Yep. And the mealworms don't go don't go bad. The dried ones. Yeah. I haven't packed for a long time. Yep. Are birds like bees and butterflies are decreasing in numbers? Diane says, you bet. Lawn chemicals are taking their toll. Yeah, despite the companies that sell them denying it. It's, yep. it's true. There's there's probably all, uh, there's a, com uh, a whole composite factors going into why we're having less of them, but pesticides have got to be part of the the, the, the equation. They really do. There's they, they are killers and they do build up. So I'm glad when people don't use them. Struggled with snowdrops. No, snowdrops are one of, the, one of the best times to get snowdrops is right now. Nancy, come by our house and we'll dig up a clump of snowdrops. They they move very well in the green, it's called, when they're, when they're growing. And you'll have no problem with them when you do that. Sometimes when you put snowdrops in the ground in the fall, the bulb will just sit for a couple of years before it comes up. And somebody has given up on it and planted something else in place of it. But if you plant them in the green, you know exactly where they are. And uh, and you and you know for sure that they are going to take. So find somebody with snowdrops, or come over here and grab some of our snowdrops. Janet's got a hand up. Hey, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, I just read an article today that there was a study done that showed that um, bees were increasing, that they weren't going down. And then, of course, part of the article also said, but someone another group said no. But they said that they were growing that that. There were colonies just growing and growing. So I was real surprised to see that. Well, that could be. That did they mention the what type? Did honey they bees. mention what type of bees? Honeybees. Oh, the honeybees. And see, the, for the most part, we're looking, the honeybees are being, uh, I can see where they could say that because there are um, a lot of people prop, propagating, um, cultivating, growing, um, husbanding uh, the, the, uh, the honeybees. But they're not native here. It's our native bees and the native insects, pretty much all over the world, that are that are, the numbers are going down. But it could be that our native bees are beginning to, to rebound because they've they've done a good job. The the uh, groups that are trying to get the word out to tell people to be kind to pollinators to help support them. I mean, there are people now that are coming to nurseries and saying, I "Have there have been insecticides in this? What's good for bees? What can I do for bees?" So. You know, it could be that we're making a difference. I'd like to think that we can make a difference. I'd really like to. Um, do you need to score snowdrop bulbs? I We never have. The only bulbs that I've scored, I score the basal plate on hyacinth to make them multiply. And that works really well because otherwise a hyacinth might stay as one bulb forever. But um, but snowdrops, they, um, they multiply real quickly. There's seedlings everywhere, even after the first year. So I've never had to do anything to the bulbs. Um, blue corridalis, does it go dormant? No, not entirely. Almost all year there's something green on it if, if it's if it's in a place where it's hardy, but I haven't had um, uh, significant steady luck um, on that. It'll make it through one year and then it won't make it through and I'll put it in after it, it dies out and I think, well, it's just short-lived and then it doesn't make it through even its first winter. So I'm not sure where it really wants to be. Janet, did we answer the question that Barb had about uh, bottles and pot and peanuts in the bottom of pots? Um, we we did. Um, okay, I I, I, I didn't hear it. It's okay. A lot goes uh, by. Okay. okay. Carolina Wren, cutie. Yep, somebody put that up. They are they are so cute. I I just think they're and such a big voice for such a little bird. I mean, they can just drown out everybody else. We have had a very um. Uh, unwanted bird episode today when Steve Steve texted me while I was at the library. He says, we have crows nesting in the yard again. We, a few years ago, we had them here. And I I, I don't mind crows. I, I, they're kind of fun to watch and they are smart birds. But when they put their nest in your yard, the the, the nestlings, once, they're, once the eggs hatch, from Ooh. dawn to dusk, they beg. And they sound like they're dying. Because crows go, ah, ah, ah. well, these guys go ah, 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 really loud. And it does sound like something strangling to death. And it goes on all day long. For three and if there's three of them, if there's three of them in a nest, it's pretty intense. It's, yes, it's loud. 
they're fun though once once they fledge and they're following around yeah. the parents that's that's always fun because the parents are doing that thing where they're running as fast as they can to get away from the, the little ones they they stay with them for sometimes for two years because they are smart and they're learning a lot but um, right. it's it's um not fun to hear them growing up Karen, we get the giant pokeweed out by digging it, really. I, I, we almost I always leave a little piece, and then you have to keep coming back at it if it's really big. I have managed to oh. dig it out. I've dug yeah. out a number of those great She's pieces. More pers- Sorry, she's more persistent than me. Yeah, um, but, but you have to go down a long way. I keep digging and digging out because some of the roots are literally this this big in diameter, and they go down and spread out and I'll keep going. And as I dig up the pieces of roots, because I'm chopping through them, at least they chop through easier than a woody root. As I chop through them, I'm looking to make sure there's no buds on them. If there's no buds showing little eyes, like on a, on a potato, I'll go, okay, I can leave this in the ground. And generally I won't see them come back then, but yeah, they are, they are massive roots. Definitely. Um, so I, I, I dig next to it because the roots tend to go straight down like a, a huge turnip. I dig next to them and go down maybe 11 or 12 inches and slice the root off, take a look and see if I don't see any eyes down there, then I'll give it a shot and say, let's see if that will take care of it. But if I see any eyes sprouting on that piece I dug up, then I'll go down and take out deeper part of it. Remove any berries. (laughs) How do you remove all those berries? Yeah, try to keep it from blooming. I cut them last year. There's a bunch of them on the neighbor's side of our um, our, of our one long border down the side. And um, they don't really do anything over there, but I don't want to be digging in their side. So I just come through and I cut them. And I think I cut them back to nothing three times during the year. And they were still four feet high and bloomed a little and had berries <laughs> at the end of the year. Very persistent plants. Diane and Waterville, um, should we score our potted Easter hyacinths before we plant? If so, could you explain the process? And two, did you say we should plant the whole plant deep, covering the blooms and green leaves now? Um, yes. Uh, yes, plant it deep. You want to get the bulb down at, at at least six inches down and preferably eight or ten inches down. And that's going to end up with your just the tips of the leaves showing up, which is okay. Um, and scoring the bulb means taking the bulb and turning it upside down. And it has a, a ring, a raised, smaller circle on the bottom that's actually the stem of the plant the the bulb itself is the composite of the leaves take that that ring on the inside and with a knife nick a couple of places in it where you're taking out a little section take a little v out of a couple sections and what that does is that injury that you did on the bulb is now going to stimulate um uh meristem tissue and some and little bubbles are going to form on the side otherwise they, they just don't much multiply um, we were going to talk about that wisteria. I guess we'll have to wait on that one for t- tomorrow, Steve. Yep. Um, because uh, I think Mary Ellen, and Mary Ellen said that she might not be here tonight. So that's good. We'll answer her because we got a wisteria question that Steve wanted to, to deal with. So what do you think? Plant, uh, uh, planted numerous crocus in lawn. Didn't, none came up. Any suggestions? Um, they didn't come up or they didn't bloom. I also said none of them came up. Somebody ate them. Yep, they might have eaten them because crocus bulbs are are much prized by squirrels and mice. So maybe somebody came through and, and dug them up and ate them. Um, even even deer can paw them up and eat them. But I have seen um, in two places this year crocuses, lots of foliage of crocus, and no bulbs. And no bulbs. No, no bloom. No cro- flowers. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe they came up and they're and they're just hiding in the lawn, but maybe they got eaten. Um, they are such tasty little bulbs. Okay. Okay. Well, we are just about at eight, we're at eight o'clock. It right? is eight. Yep. Um, eight o'clock. We'll uh, see what we can do about editing this video and putting it up on the on our, our, our public YouTube channel. And, and we'll see you next week. No, no. No. Yes. Oh, well, we'll see. Yes, next week, because we have a webinar this weekend. This, this session wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> right. Right. So I think I put it all on here, if we say yeah. that's for this week. Yeah, the next time is April 12th, because next week we have an, have a webinar. Our first season five webinar is next week already. Oh, so we we do do back-to-back webinars. Just One question wasn't it. answered. What question? <laughs> okay, what do we miss? Thank you, Nancy. I tried so hard. <laughs>
<laughs> if someone is here, we'll type it in. Is a that Ruth question about the tulips, maybe? Nancy. Oh, tulips. Yep, yeah, tulips yeah. from Ruth. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, tulips didn't bloom. Any way to get them to bloom or to get rid of them? It was actually in, it was a reply bubble to one of Karen's. So oh, that, that one was by. hidden. That I, I was wondering what that meant, the color. Yeah. Uh, and I think okay. there's a question on junipers that Karen wants us to talk about. So I'll, I'll stick around here for a couple minutes to do that. But the tulips, if the tulips aren't blooming anymore, chances are really good that the bulbs are too small now to support bloom. Dig them up, divide them, put them in deeper so that they get a better rest in the summertime. The closer they are to the surface, the moister they stay and the more they stay active growing and, and and dividing instead of resting. So put them in deep and put them in with each each little bulb separate. But I think when you dig them up, you're going to find that you've got a clump of small tulip bulbs now rather than any big blooming sized ones. What was yeah. your question on the junipers, Karen? Let's see, I saw it go by. Great. What would you suggest? I saw something. What would you suggest to replace 16 year old giant junipers to hide big utility boxes in a bed that's in the front of berm in the front yard? Um, something that's growing, that grows really fast, right? Um, Evergreen. Does it, have, does it really have to, divide, to to hide it in the winter time too? Because if it has to hide it in the winter time too, then you're you're going to need something that's evergreen. And I'd, I'd lean toward a Berkwood Viburnum so that I've got something that's going to be faster than the needled evergreens. And I go with Berkwood Viburnum. If you don't have to look at it, in, in if you don't have to hide it right through the winter, I'd use something like Ural False Virea or um, even, even the American Beauty Berry, something that's going to grow quickly and be real leafy. Um, yeah, he's all, all year round, though. It's all year round, yeah. Then I, I'd go with Berkwood Viburnum. You're going to have to prune them to keep them from getting too big, probably, um, if the juniper size is a problem for you. But they are they are faster to grow than the other ever. I'm not sure that they would hold their leaves as well. Well, some some winters they don't hold their leaves. But, yeah, but, but those their are leaves the, are those tend to be a little smaller too. So it has it. Yeah, let them be healthy. They lose that. They tend to lose their leaves in the colder. Um, winters and that that's when there's more snow so there'd be yeah. strong branches which is a little bit better um what else could you use bayberry is bayberry hardy up there yeah bayberry's hardy up there and there's a lot of limelight in that bed so bayberry should be hardy up there yeah let's um, see what else would i use anything you put in there that's going to be fast and needled evergreen you're going to have to keep cutting and cutting and cutting which maybe is okay. Steve and I are now at the point where we're saying, we've only got another 20 years, so we're only going to have to cut it four or five times. Um, um, so we planted an Alaska fall cypress that we're going to let somebody else worry about how big it's going to get someday. Um, what else is fast? Yes, Teresa, there's a webinar tomorrow morning, and you should have gotten an invite. If you didn't, please email us. We'll send another one. Yeah, or go to your resource page because the link is there. Yeah, yeah the resource page too, sorry. And we will have to sign off now or there won't be a webinar tomorrow because I'm still sifting through yep. 400 pictures. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Save the chat if you want to um, save the chat because we won't be um, sending it out or anything, but we'll post this as soon as we can post it. Thank you for being here. See you all, all right. later. Bye now. Ta-ta for now. Have a good one. Congrats on the, uh, on the first run.